Hey there, soldier. Have you also found yourself completely infatuated with a tiefling who runs as hot as the hells? If you watched my Astarian video, or you're watching this video because you already know about and enjoy Baldur's Gate 3, then we don't need a recap of the basics of what the game is. But a quick rundown for those who may not know, Baldur's Gate 3 is essentially Dungeons & Dragons the video game, and it's got an incredibly rich story about the cycles of abuse, the greed for power, tyranny, and breaking these cycles or perpetuating them depending on how you play. And just like Astarian, Karlak's personal story plays right into that. Less so in the will she perpetuate the cycles of abuse since she is, and I say this with so much love and respect for both of these characters, a much, much better person morally than Astarian is. But who exactly is Karlak? Ten years ago, I was sold to the Archdevil Zariel. She put a hellfire engine in my chest and made me her prized soldier. But I've escaped now. Thank you, Mind Flayers. And I've got a few scores to settle. If this engine doesn't burn me to ash first, I'll need people I can trust. An infernal mechanic and a serious amount of luck. But you know what? I'm not worried. After 10 years in the Hells, I can take on anything. I've got my chance at freedom, and believe me, I'm going home. Karlak is our fiery friend. She's a tiefling who'd gotten mixed up with the Mind Flayer mishap when the Nautiloid went to Avernus during the intro to the game. Depending on who you came across first, and let's be real here, it's much easier to find Will. Karlak is initially introduced as a bloodthirsty devil who is dangerous and needing to be taken down. A devil with one horn that Will, the monster hunter, has been tasked with taking down. However, when you actually meet her, you learn that that is pretty far from the truth. Yes, she is a little bloodthirsty, but only thirst to take down those who have wronged her and deserve it. Yeah, I am the first person to say that we as human beings can't dictate who deserves to live and who doesn't. And in a real world setting, I do believe that in most cases it's wrong for another human to have the power to decide who gets to live and who doesn't. But in fictional settings, it's a lot easier to be swayed, especially in Baldur's Gate, where those who are presented as deserving death are so cartoonishly evil and horrible and set in their ways that removing them from this world is nothing but a tender mercy for those who were victimized or would potentially be harmed. The irony that the world is looking more and more like that cartoonishly evil and is just, it's not lost on me, I'm aware. <laughs> But we're talking about Faerun here, so I'll move on. Full disclaimer, I have only finished one playthrough of Baldur's Gate, and out of all now seven of my playthroughs, I've romanced Astarian in four of them, I'm playing Astarian in two of them, one of which is with a full party of friends, so romancing's not as feasible, and I'm romancing Will in one, and also, my most recent playthrough is a Bloodweave playthrough, so my look into Karlak will have more insight to her platonic storyline. I've I've pretty much concluded that Karlak's story doesn't change that much when you romance her, unlike Astarian or Gale, who I feel like their personal story is greatly impacted by if you're romancing them or not. But if I am wrong, I would love for you guys to let me know what I've missed. But without further ado, let's be besties with Karlak. There are a couple different paths you can take to meeting Karlak. You can explore and stumble across her yourself, or you can meet Will first. And I think you can also meet um, some paladins first, although I've never seen what that plays out like. Um, Will has been tasked with hunting Karlak down, and if you meet him first, you can offer to help him kill her. This will put a marker on your map, of where to find Karlak, and I'm willing to bet this is how most people found her. She's kind of hidden away in a part of the map that I never came across while exploring on my first playthrough until I learned halfway through Act 2 that um, I missed a couple companions, namely Will and Karlak. I didn't, I didn't speak to either of them. I didn't speak to Will at all in the Grove, so I just completely missed him. 
Yeah, she's really hard to come across without that marker on your map. At least for me, she was. You could also probably get a similar thing if you make the paladins a tier first, since they are also hunting Karlak down, but I can't verify that information. That's just a gut feeling. I guess I could have verified that information, but it doesn't matter. Either way, once you find her, you see that she's pretty much on fire. She's burning from the inside out, but she's doing all right. She's okay. If you ask her if she's all right, she responds that she's never been better. <sighs> never been better. Despite her obviously having a tough time, Karlak responds with optimism. Yeah, she's not doing too great, but she's happy to be alive and happy to be out of Avernus. What more could she need? Her optimism is incredibly contagious, and I believe that she is just having a good time despite the odds. Just like Astarian, she has freshly escaped captivity, so she really is just grateful to be there. It's you, from the Nautiloid. Please tell me I found you before those so-called Paladins of Tear did. She recognizes the player pretty quickly from the Nautiloid. Her tone is one of excitement mixed with caution. She hopes you've met her before you met a group pretending to be Paladins of Tear. A quick D&D lesson for those who may need it, a paladin is a person who is essentially a righteous fighter or a knight of some sorts. They swear to uphold justice and typically stand with the good things of the world and hunt down forces of evil. A paladin is usually bound by an oath that grants them power, either through devotion to a god or just the commitment to justice. However, the paladins hunting Karlak are not real paladins. At least, she seems to think they aren't, and this is important because if they were real paladins, and Karlak was telling the truth about who she is, they would be breaking their oath hunting her. I think that's a very important detail that is necessary for understanding this whole paladin thing. <laughs> there are a few things you can say in response to this. You can ask her about her flames, where she was on the ship, since you only came across Lazelle and Shadowheart. It's honestly really funny how Karlak and Astarian both mention seeing you from their pods, I guess, because we sure did not see them. You could tell her that you haven't met the Paladins. I'm sure this plays out differently if you had met the Paladins, but I hadn't at this point, and this is true for every single one of my playthroughs. You could also ask her about the Paladins and how she got mixed up with them. Each branch does lead to the same outcome, though. She'll start to explain, and then your tadpoles connect, showing you pieces of her backstory. Then you're lost in visions of demonic armies as you tear through a landscape of fire and blood. I like how this is just how everyone introduces themselves you to us now. Above as the Nautiloid passed through Avernus. This woman was on the front line. If you tell her that that brain connection thing was the tadpoles, she's got a pretty funny line about how That'll explain all the voices. <laughs> She's just been out here raw-dogging life, but now you're here, and you've made some kind of headway into figuring out the whole mind flare tadpole in the brain situation. She only says this because if you found her here, you've likely already been to the Emerald Grove and spoke with the healer Nettie, who's told you about Halson, who is your only real lead to a cure, I might add, aside from Lazel's suggestion of a Githyanki crush which you also find a lead for in the Emerald Grove, so either way, you've been to the Grove already, most likely. Throughout this whole conversation, Karlak has an air of taking things as they are. She is a go-with-the-flow kind of gal, and she is literally just vibing. After a bit of introduction, literally just exchanging names, she calls the two of you old pals. I really love how quick she is to make friends with you and your companions, although part of me thinks that part of the reason she calls you two old pals is she's trying to create a connection here because she is asking you to commit some murder on her behalf. She asks how you'd feel about helping her take down some evil bastards, but before you answer, she does go ahead and give you some details in case your moral compass needed it. Well met, soldier. <laughs> now that we're old pals, how would you feel about helping me kill some evil bastards? Sure. A little background, if your moral compass needs something to point at. You already know I fought in the Blood War. I was good at killing demons. Really good. So good, Zariel, the Archdevil herself, made me her personal attack dog. Oh. I played along until I could get the fuck out of there. 
It took me ten years to probably escape, but now I'm free. Zariel sent goon after goon to hunt me down. But believe me when I tell you, I'm not going. The latest I like her. Dog she <laughs> She's gonna be a permanent the fixture on our team. Posing as paladins of tear. Wanna help me take them down? Um, sure? Karlak explains that she was a victim of Zariel, an archdevil in Avernus, and she had to play along until she could escape. But now that she's free, Zariel is sending out people to bring her back, the latest being the paladins. This is also when she becomes a companion in your party. Typically by this point, you'd already have the full four-person group for exploring, so she goes to your camp. But she does ask for you to wait for her until you go hunt down those paladins. Also, if you have Shadowheart on your adventuring party, she'll fall in love at first sight. Take Faerun by the short hairs. Sound good? I like her. She looks like she could throw me over her shoulder and carry me to safety. Should the need arise. I am more of a Shadowheart and Lazel. Uh, toxic Yuri, enemies to lovers, enjoyer myself, but Shadowheart was so real for this, and she and Karlak would be so cute together. You could bypass most of this and just outright kill Karlak instead of hearing her out and taking her severed head back to Will, but no one is doing that unless they're doing an evil run. And let's be real, anyone who loves Karlak enough to click on this video or make this video. <laughs> we we are so in love with her that we are not making that decision. Also, this would lock her companion quest line since she's, you know, not around. If you keep the peace though, you can now add her to your party and I highly suggest you do so if you plan on going to take care of the paladins right then and there since you're already there and she'd already asked so nicely to not be left out of the fun. So, Hit that go to camp button, swap your party around, and take her out for some, I don't know, fun? <laughs> for a good-fashioned brawl. When you confront the paladins, through insight or detecting thoughts, you find out that Karlak was telling the truth about these guys. These paladins are, in fact, evil frauds. So rest assured for those of you who don't just do bad things because a hot person is asking you to, you're clear to do this. Moral compass has never been better. The fight is a bit difficult depending on your level and team makeup, but once it's over, Karlak is overjoyed. She gets a bit of reckless, barbarian, rage, fuel vibes going on, and kind of destroys the place, leaving a path of fire in her wake. It's honestly kind of cute how happy she is to get these paladins off of her ass, and it's, it's kind of like she's stimming to deal with the extra energy and feelings after doing this battle. After she gets that out of her system though, you're able to talk to her. While none of the characters in this game are keen to share the extent of their tragic backstories when they first meet you, Karlak just straight up tells you now is not the time. How did you get an infernal engine for her heart? Pain tolerance and a dynamic duo of truly shitty bosses. But Damn, it's a that's bit fair. early in the game to be getting into tragic backstories. Let's save the Scar show for later. After we've worked up an appetite for tragedy. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'll need to find someone who can tune up my engine sooner rather than later. She doesn't deny the existence of a tragic backstory, and in order to gain your trust, she does need to explain that she was more or less held captive and forced to fight on the front lines in the Blood Wars, which I guess is a war going on in Avernus between devils and stuff. I I don't know the full details of the Blood Wars. It's never fully explained, but like you know enough to understand. She's upfront enough for the player to understand and empathize with her, but she's keeping the gory details safe for when the two of you are closer. As the narrative unfolds around Karlak and the other companions, most characters are more or less forced to open up about the different aspects of their trauma as it relates to the narrative, and each character handles it pretty differently. Astarian wears his heart on his sleeve, as this is likely the first chance he's ever had to really talk about his past. Will and Gale will share what they can when you need to know it, especially since both of their stories can have a huge impact on the player. Karlak shares what you need to know to understand her, but she's not opposed to answering your questions and sharing her thoughts and feelings on it as the two of you get closer. She's willing to be open, but she doesn't want to be a downer. 
She knows her story is tragic, but she's doing her best to move past the pain to find the beauty in life. This is one of the first ways I believe she's a foil to Astarian specifically. Both of their lived experiences have shown them nothing but the cruelties and ugliness of the world. But with Astarian, depending on how you play, it's up to you to show him that there is beauty and kindness in the world still. However, Karlak strongly believes, despite everything, that there is still good things out there. She doesn't need you to show her that. She sees the value in the small things. Karlak is a person who is actively finding the beauties of living, and she also strives to be a part of the good out there. She can make a difference, and she can bring good into the world. So she does. Karlak isn't overly heroic in her actions, but she approves of your good and heroic deeds. She sees the goodness in your heart as a strength and not a weakness to be exploited, or idealism promising false hope. And in the case of those who start a run intending to be evil but swap it up once meeting her, she brings that kindness and beauty into the player's life as well. Once you bring Karlak back to camp and have a long rest for the first time with both her and Will in your group, you get a confrontation between the two that ultimately results in Karlak and the player being able to reason with Will and he quickly sees the lies and what he had been told about her. I swear to you, on all I am, I am not what you think. Shit! Shit. You really are no devil, are you? I've... I've been deceived. He was only supposed to hunt down devils and monsters, the heartless kind of vibes. The one who gave him that order to hunt Karlak, his patron Mazora, stands by the fact that Karlak is heartless, and she's right on a technicality. Karlak's heart has been replaced with a piece of infernal machinery. She has an engine where her heart should be. Technically heartless, but she has so much heart to her. There's a bit of a contrast between her body and her personality in a way. Karlak is eager to settle things with Will and happy to be his friend once everyone is on the same page. Glad same. they can make peace. Now, instead of a liability, I've got a friend. Or I will have Sue, anyway. Five minutes ago, this man was calling her a devil and talking about how he was supposed to hunt her, and now she's like, yeah, I'm glad he saw the truth and we can be besties now, which is wild to me. Yes, I know that Will is a great man, one of the best, actually, but if I were in Karlak's shoes, I'd like to think I would be a bit more cautious than that. But Karlak gets a good read on people. She sees the best in them. Karlak seems like the kind of person who would be really big on trusting her gut, and while that doesn't always work out, she's willing to give it a try. She's eager to make friends, to share love, to connect with others. We know at this point that she'd spent the last 10 years being held captive in Avernus, and I would imagine that it would be hard to make and keep friends on the front lines of a war, so it's not too wild to think that she hasn't been able to really build relationships or connections with others for quite some time. In Act 2, if you take her to Moonrise Towers, when speaking with one of the merchants in Moonrise Towers, she'll mention how there was a Cambion in Avernus that was the closest thing she'd ever had to a friend there, and even then she couldn't trust this person. So, Karlak is starving for some genuine human connection. If you ask her about her time in Avernus, you can learn that she ended up there because she was sold to the Archdevil Zariel, by the person she trusted most. I would also imagine that even for Karlak, that had an impact on her desire to connect with others, especially right after it had happened. But she's in a place now where she feels free to trust again. It's unclear if she ever developed trust issues after that, but we know now that she's more than willing to trust you and the rest of your companions. She's willing to trust those who have a good heart, who wouldn't do her wrong, would stand by her. During her time in Avernus, Karlak was more or less the subject of some pretty sadistic experiments, the result of which are pretty apparent. She's covered in scars and signs of machinery. There are literal holes in her body. Those little air vent things on her shoulder. Also, the nasty scarring on 
that one shoulder and her arms that kind of looks like veins or something. Like Astarian, her body isn't her own, or at least it wasn't treated as such. However, Karlak still retained a feeling of ownership over herself. She never let go of hope. Since I'm comparing her to Astarian, I know there's the notion that he may have had it worse. He had it for 200 years and a lot of sexual trauma that's gonna hit a little bit different than what Karlak went through. And Karlak also only suffered for 10 years. But I, that's, that's not how trauma works. You can't compare them like that. These two characters are meant to represent two different ways of dealing with similar things. The difference is in who they are at their core, their personalities and ways of thinking greatly affect how they deal with and process things. And we see that at work with Karlak's headstrong personality compared to Astarian's doing whatever it takes to survive, even sacrificing himself in a way. Both characters are incredibly resilient and strong in their own rights, but Karlak's strength is more traditional. She holds on to herself, her morals and outlook on life, and I think that's part of where her strength comes from. In a way, Karlak is kind of the perfect victim, unlike Astarian, which is a whole other can of worms. <laughs> Karlak is pretty sure of herself, and despite her only being able to escape with the help of the Mind Flayers, much like Astarian, she's not lost sight of her own strengths. Sure, she's got weaknesses, but she doesn't focus on them. Honestly, I could learn a lot from her. <laughs> One drawback that Karlak cannot just ignore or power through, though, is that her infernal engine for a heart causes her to run pretty hot really hot, actually. Her mechanical heart needs to be regularly tuned up to keep that heat in check. And while in Faerun, she's a little out of whack and it's running so hot that she can't even touch others, at least until you can find an infernal mechanic who can help her out. Someone with so much love to give cursed to be out of touch. I only hope she doesn't become out of time either. If she likes you enough, pretty early on, she'll confess that she wants to ride you until you see stars. Oh, gods, I want to ride you till you see stars. Oh! <laughs> oh! Wait! <laughs> Wait a minute! <laughs> it pained me to turn her down, and I regret it to this day. That's the playthrough where I'm romancing Will. I was trying to romance a Starian, but I'm playing as a Joe Star. And if you know anything about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, you know that Joe Stars are kind of typically heroic and goody two shoes kind of vibes. I'm I'm channeling Jonathan Joe Star specifically. Um, so Starian didn't like me, but Will really liked me. But Karlak asked me early on enough that I thought I still had a chance with the vampire, so I turned her down. <laughs> Due to her condition, these desires to ride you till you see stars can only be fantasies. But it is enough for her to know that you care for her and like her in that way if you don't turn her down. She's so touch-starved and she aches for human connection, but she can deal with what she's missing by focusing on what she does have. Just being around you makes her feel alive, really and truly alive. Your kindness, your strengths, it all brings light into Karlak's life. It's pretty hard to realize that She's a person who needs that, though. She keeps the more negative aspects of her emotions pretty well hidden. She feels more rage towards her abusers than she does sadness for her situation, at least outwardly. I'm pretty inclined to believe that she focuses on this rage that can be directed outwards towards others because it's easier to handle, easier to express, and easier to potentially resolve. We also learn that she was a bit scrappy growing up and got into a lot of fights. So anger is probably a more familiar emotion for her as well. Very worn in and comfortable. I know, helping her get her engine tuned can start in Act 1 and you could pretty much do it all in Act 1. Um, but I've consistently had better luck not only getting iron, but also having the iron and talking to Damon, the infernal mechanic in act two or later so this is going in act two i know damon's in the grove in act one um it's just this is just how it's always worked out for me i'm sorry 
if you help the tieflings leave the grove in Act 1, you can find Damon in Last Light Inn, where he is able to use any infernal iron you found on your journey to tune up Karlak's engine. Now that's hot. Too hot. I think I could sort you out. But I'll need some infernal iron and a lot of luck. Hey, soldier. We've got some infernal iron already. Let's give it to him, eh? Please let this work. Mmm. The weight of it. And that blaze of chaos. Can't imagine this where my heart should be. Must be quite the experience. The first repair doesn't help enough to allow her to touch others, but it makes her feel more stable and regulated, which is always a good thing. It also powers her up a bit, at least narratively. She says she feels stronger, which is what the Infernal Engine was put in her heart to do to begin with. It's supposed to make her a super soldier of sorts. Damon's upgrade didn't cool me down, but it did juice me up. I don't think I've ever felt more powerful. Damon then makes plans to try and help out more. You just need to bring him back some more iron. Which, there's a few places to find more iron in the Shadow Cursed Lands, and he can give you a lead on where to check first. However, after a day or two of him researching, he's realized that there is some bad news to go along with this tune-up. I think you'll want to hear the bad news too. Yeah, sure. But first, fix me. Please. Sure, he can fix her up with a second piece of infernal iron, and she's able to touch others again, which is such a great relief to her. You're able to give her a hug, even if you're not romancing her, which is so nice. It's a well-needed, heartfelt hug, and I love how you can do this with her even if your relationship is strictly platonic. I know with Astarian, hugging him is an option, but it's more of a romantic hug. A hug to show him that he matters and that you care, but it's ultimately locked in his romantic storyline. I'd also like to interpret this as Karlak being a, the kind of person who hugs everyone. She's a hugger. She'll hug her partner, she'll hug her friends, she'll hug anyone who needs it. I'm not sure if any of the other characters, um, if you can hug them. I'm romancing Will in a playthrough and I've made it to Act 3 and I cannot hug him. I don't know if you can hug a Gale at any point. I don't know if you can hug Shadowheart. I'm pretty certain you cannot hug Lazelle. She probably needs it, but she doesn't seem like the kind that that would be so willing to let you hug her. It doesn't matter though. This video is about Carlac. <laughs> Damon though still has to tell her the bad news that he did try to tell her sooner. When he first tells you about the bad news, if you don't have the infernal iron on you, Carlac's like, bro, I don't care. Let's go get this iron. Let's go get me tuned up again and I can touch people. She, she doesn't want to know the bad news. She only wants to focus on the good. But after the second tune-up, Damon has to tell her. It doesn't matter that she doesn't want to hear it. She needs to know. Before you go, there's something I need to tell you. That engine of yours, it's contained for the moment, but it's just too hot to exist here in the material plane indefinitely. I know you know that. But the thing is, there's a cure. I wasn't making any headway with the mechanics, none at all. The environment here is just too cold to sustain metals like the ones inside you. You have to return to Avernus. For good. Or this thing is going to burn you up from the inside out. And sooner than you think. Carlac's heart will not last long out of Avernus. If she doesn't return to the place she fought so hard to escape for 10 years, then she will die. Burnt up in the heat and ran down into the ground. She's so young for such a grim fate. We don't know her exact age, but it's safe to say that Carlac is in her early to mid 30s. Or possibly late 20s at her youngest, but most definitely in her 30s. That may not sound young to some, 
but that is incredibly young when you consider one's mortality. Tieflings mature at the same rate as humans and live just about as long. Although some resources say that a tiefling can live up to 100 to 200 years, I'm inclined to believe that's not super common. It's like how humans can live past 100 years in real life, but that very rarely happens. Most only live until their 70s or 80s. At her oldest, Karlak is just barely reaching the halfway through her expected lifespan, just a little bit below. That is assuming she would fall on the shorter end of the lifespan as well. This news is really upsetting for Karlak, and honestly, anyone who cares about her, even Karlak can't optimism her way through this one, but she still tries. She wants to ignore the inevitable, make it evitable even if she can. Karlak would rather celebrate the good news and leave the bad news for when she can't ignore it any longer. She's resigned herself to dying young, though, unwilling to return to Avernus, and honestly, I can't blame her. She would rather live her life short and bright, going out fighting the absolute if she can make it that long, than return to the worst and darkest era of her life. She's finally free, only to be told that she must return or give up everything. Either way, she's giving up everything. It's a very difficult decision, and I think many people would choose to live on their own terms, burning out prematurely rather than risking going back into captivity in hell, quite literally. Karlak has a will to live, though. She isn't making this decision out of any suicidal desire or ideation. It's just simply the better option to her. She even talks about how she has so much life left and really, really wants to live. If there's one thing I can say about the characters in Baldur's Gate, it's that they are all survivors. They'll each fight until their last breath to live another day, and Karlak is no exception. All of this is really upsetting, and if you push the issue, Karlak will ask if you guys can talk about it later. Let her have this one good thing. Let her enjoy the ability to touch others again. This is the best day of her life, and she just wants to focus on what she's been given and not what's been taken from her. Unlike Astarian, Karlak's personal story doesn't go too much farther than this. Honestly, Astarian has significantly more content in the game than pretty much every other character. There are YouTube videos that have every voice line from the characters just in the compilation, and Astarian's is hours longer than like anybody else. He is the main character. <laughs> this is partly due to his personal storyline, not directly tying into the main story, so there has to be a lot of extra content to flesh out his thing. And his storyline is also more fleshed out than the others that I've played through. Shadow Hearts is pretty fleshed out. Lazel's, I feel like, is also pretty fleshed out, but you can get most of hers, at least platonically, done like by the end of Act 1. Um... But both Shadowheart and Lazelle's are very tied into what you have to do just to play the base storyline of the game. Carlax and Wills, and honestly Gales, while they are directly tied to the main story of the game, they're very lacking. At least when you don't romance Gale, it's very sparse and lacking. Like, there's, there is stuff there. And maybe it's because I didn't get to know Gale as much as I should have. Um, but with Karlak and Will, I am getting to know them. And it's just, there's just not as much to chew on with them as there is with Astarian. There's, there was very clearly a favorite <laughs> for the people making the game. I don't know if that's actually true. But all this to say, Astarian just got more fleshed out. That's not to say, though, that Karlak's story isn't just as insightful or well-written, though. Yeah, it's disappointing that she gets less. Like I said before, Karlak and Will enjoyers are out here struggling, although I am aware that, especially Will, his character wasn't really in the game from day one. I think Karlak and Will were both kind of added along as they made the game, whereas Astarian was there from day one. But what little we do get for Karlak does go a long way to establish her character and her psyche. 
Carlac is a woman who is brimming with love and with life, despite the hand that's been dealt to her. She's optimistic, even when faced with the most dire and dark of circumstances. But Carlac is not positive to the point of it being toxic. She's real, and she has emotions, and she's allowed to feel them. We see her start to express her deep sadness as the game goes on. It peeks through her anger at times. And Carlac also isn't afraid to let the anger just boil over and peek through, but she does seem less comfortable sitting in her sadness. When her rage starts to teeter more towards the sadness, she tries to nip it in the bud, save it for later, or lean more into the anger. Anger is safe, anger keeps her motivated to keep fighting. It's much easier to fight when you're boiling than it is when you're drowning. While she's fighting for her own life, Carlac is also fiercely loyal to you and your ragtag group of misfits. During Act 2, after you find out about the ritual that Astarian is bound to via the scars on his back, Carlac becomes very protective of him. <laughs> Wish I could say I was surprised about Cazador's pact. Where blood, death, and betrayal parade, you can bet your ass a devil is riding Grand Marshal. We're going to keep Astarian safe. On my life, Cazador won't touch him. I think she was very protective of your group since she got invited into it, but this is the first time she's directly expressed it, at least the first time I noticed. Even though Astarian is a bit prickly and difficult to get along with at times, especially for somebody like Karlak who is always striving to do what's best, she still values his friendship, his presence in the group. She vows to not let Kazador lay a finger on Astarian. She matches my energy here, honestly. The other companions have problems that are a bit beyond what you can fight off. I'm talking literal gods and devils you can't exactly square up with without dire circumstances. But I firmly believe that if Gael wanted to go fight Mistra, Karlak would do her best to help out and keep him safe. If Will wanted to strike down Mazora, and if he could do that without damning himself, Karlak would be right there. Right there being like, fuck you, Mazora. <laughs> Honestly, she kind of already is. But if we if we made plans to go fight Mazora, Karlak would be down. Oh, she'd be so down. She would want Will to have that catharsis, and she would want to be there to help Will and to make sure nothing happened to him. She was quick to consider us all friends, but it's a real and deep connection on her part. She cares a lot, and I don't think that's just her making up for lost time. I feel like Karlak has always been a big feeler, and it would still... She would still make fast friends and be this loyal, even if she didn't have her trauma and the 10 years of missing out. Karlak just has a lot of love to give. She always has. I need this woman to know that I would lay down my life for her. We are going to the ends of the earth for one another, and we're both going to do the impossible for the safety and well-being of the other companions in our group. We gotta make camp one giant queer platonic polycule. Karlak's personal story comes to a head in Act 3, when you face Gortash. This can be as soon as or as late as you'd like. If she's on your party when you go to his coronation, she actually tries to confront him right then and there, at the start of Act 3, pretty much. It's him. Gortash. <sighs> this is it. I can practically taste his blood from here. Just seeing him brings her blood to a boil, and for good reason. But regardless, Gortash will brush off the encounter and you won't actually fight him until later. Is, is it wrong to say her personal story comes to a head for this? Because the actual quest line for her personal story is completed after you finish all the mechanical heart stuff, but Gortash does play into her character arc and her story, so I'm counting it. I don't care if the journal doesn't. It might, actually. I don't know. I don't think it does. By asking her questions at camp throughout the game thus far, you can learn that Karlag used to work for Gortash, actually. She really, really respected him. She had been a bit prone to getting into scuffles as a kid, so when a job opportunity came up that allowed her to channel that energy into something that was a little bit more productive, it was a no-brainer. 
The job worked to her strengths and paid well. What more could you need? It paid her well enough that she was able to provide for her family, allowing for her parents to live in a better area, and for her to start saving up to build a future for herself. Carlac's life seemed to fall into place when she started working for Gortash, and all she had to do was act as a guard of sorts for this indoorsy type of guy, a guy who also seemed to respect her. She says that Gortash said she was perfect, compliments and flattery that went a long way for her self-esteem. She also does explain it wasn't in that way. They had no romantic feelings or anything. She just really liked being appreciated, and she's so real for that. They had what seemed to be a perfect work dynamic. She took her job seriously, and she trusted and respected Gortash, and she thought that he trusted and respected her as well. I mean, he literally put his life in her hands. So you can see why she would think that. <laughs> so you can also imagine the life-shattering betrayal she felt when Gortash sold her to Zariel, like she was nothing more than a weapon to be used, stripping her of her personhood and reducing her to nothing more than a science experiment. It's when she's talking about Gortash that Karlak shows the most hurt and sadness, and rightfully so. She gave that man her life and he tossed her to the side on a whim. A little about Gortash, for those who don't care about spoilers and don't know or are watching this video because you love me and you don't really care about Baldur's Gate. <laughs> Gortash is the chosen for the god Bane, who is the god of tyranny. Gortash is more or less a tyrant slaver. He doesn't care for others, not truly, really, except for maybe the Dark Urge character, but that's a different story. It's highly implied that Gortash and Dark Urge had a uh, intimate relationship, and there's also like some letters of Gortash flirting with other characters, but I, I don't know how real that is. <laughs> Gortash is a man who is driven by his greed for power and the way he can use that power to inflict harm on or control others. This is the truth of the man that Karlak devoted her life to. This is the man that she would come to see after he betrayed her. I, I'm gonna be real, I do not like Gortash. His, his stage presence, his character presence is pretty fun, and I do understand the appeal for people who love Gortash. Trust me, I see it, I understand. But I can't get past the fact that this man looks like he would have groomed teenagers at Warped Tour. And you know I'm right. <laughs> you know I'm right. Anyway, I had to speak my truth. When it comes time to actually fight Gortash, you better bring Karlak with you so she can strike that bastard down and gain a bit of closure for that part of her life. However, Unlike the excitement she felt when striking down the fake paladins in Act 1, once you kill Gortash, Karlak responds with a level of sadness and defeat that we rarely see her express. She feels like there should be something to celebrate after Gortash's death, a sunset to ride off into or something, but she doesn't have that. All she is left with is a hollow feeling and the knowledge that she's going to die soon. So Gortash is nothing more than a pile of flesh. Same as the rest of us. I don't feel like I've won. All I feel is tired. Is that it then? Killed the bastard who ruined my life and now I crawl into a corner and die. Am I fucking missing something? Instead of happiness, there's just bitter anger and sadness. This whole thing isn't fair. He ruined her life and killing him didn't do anything to fix it. It didn't do anything for her. Gortash doesn't even feel remorse. He's just as unsorry of an evil bastard now as he was 10 minutes ago when he was alive. Karlak doesn't get that satisfaction of knowing that he saw where he went wrong. She doesn't get the satisfaction of an apology. And she's still dying because of his actions. Nothing can change that. Killing him was pointless to her. An act of revenge that did nothing. 
changed nothing. She's not now free like Astarian was after killing Cazador. This changed nothing for her, her dynamic with life, her dynamic with anybody. It, it was empty. Karlak is still missing her heart, and she faces a fate like Gortash. Death. Death is not kind, not to her, not to anyone. She's finally having her breakdown about how things have turned out. After 10 years of torment, loneliness, all of that fighting, just for nothing. He's dead. And he's no fucking sorrier now than he was before. What was the point? I'm still dying. I'm dying. I'm going to die. Don't say that. So you found some way to fix me. But now Gortash is dead. I'll get my heart back. My heart. It was mine. And they took it. I'm going to be as dead as Gortash any day now. Any moment. And what then? Off to the City of Judgment to waste into oblivion? Into the dirt to get eaten by maggots? Is that it for me? Is that fucking all? And you, you'll just keep going, won't you? Watching the stars. Warming your hands on the campfire, dancing, eating, making fucking love all night. All of it, all of it! That's my reward for everything I suffered. That's why I survived ten years of torment. The fighting, the clawing, the loneliness. <laughs> the fucking loneliness. All of it so I could rot. Because the person I trusted the most gave me away to the devil. It isn't fair. I don't want it like this. The performance here. The actors for this game are all phenomenal. Holy shit, they're amazing. They do so much. They breathe so much life and feeling into these characters. Oh my gosh, Carlax actor. I, I like I cried the first time I saw this. It was so good. So well done. Karlak now feels lost. All she wants to do is live, stay with her friends that she's made in your group, enjoy the life that she's fought so hard for, the life that she deserves. But that doesn't seem to be her future. After all of this, Karlak acknowledges that she needs a moment and dismisses herself back to camp. She is the only character that does this. The only character that is so shaken up by the end of their personal quest that they have to go take a break to decompress and process. Hell, Astarian, who also had a very emotional and raw breakdown after killing Cazador, just tells you that he needs a moment to process things and can't really talk about it right now, but he stays out on the town with you. He stays in the group. Honestly, I feel like Astarian knows that he would be better off being with people than alone at camp. That's a different story. But he, like, he doesn't dismiss himself. Shadowheart, who gets her whole world turned upside down, just dyes her hair and stays on the adventuring squad. She never takes a break. The emptiness Karlak was left with after killing Gortash, the man who has been responsible for pretty much everything that's gone wrong and happened to her in the last 10 years, it takes a huge toll on her. She can't just push through this like she has with everything else. She must face her more negative feelings because there's no silver lining to look for here. After a little while, she is able to get back to her usual self and join the party again if you ask her to. But wow, Karlak is doomed by the narrative, huh? I also need to take a time to recognize that people do deal with things differently, and I'm not saying Karlak was more upset about stuff than Shadowheart or Astarian or anyone else, but the contrast in her usual nature to this version of her after the Gortash fight is just shocking. But I... 
I don't know. I'd expected a triumphant display of energy afterwards. Maybe a final rush of anger for what he did to her, but there was nothing. Just bitterness, sadness, loss. It's the contrast and the the fact that Carlac can't just optimism her way through this that makes it hit so much harder. That makes her feel like she can't just throw on a happy face and go about her day. She needs to go chill out for a second. Whereas the other characters, they either didn't have that happy face to put on to begin with, or they needed to be around people that supported them, not by themselves at camp. So, I don't know. I feel like that's very... It just... It hits so hard. <laughs> at the end of the game, also, hi, yes, spoilers for, like, legit end game stuff, so be wary. Carlac's character arc, or things that I feel are relevant when discussing who she is as a person goes up to the very very end unlike Astarian so there are finale spoilers like actual finale spoilers okay so if you haven't finished act three and you do care about how the game ends click off all right you've been warned <laughs> at the end of the game depending on your decisions you are faced with the decision to become a mind flare for the greater good or force someone else to do it in your place, be it a teammate or Orpheus. Let it be known, what I'm about to say I have not done myself, but a friend did it and has relayed the information. But if you pick Carlac, or if Carlac, Car let's be real, you don't pick Carlac, she offers herself, but I think you do still get the final say. If you pick Carlac as the person to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, turn her into a mind flare, so that someone on your side has the power to use the stones against the nether brain. Carlac takes this turn of events really well. At this point in the story, she's resigned herself to dying pretty soon, but if she becomes a mind flayer, shedding her form for a new body essentially, getting a new heart, she still gets to live. She risks losing her freedom, she risks becoming someone she's not, but at least she can keep living. Carlac is always looking for the silver lining in any situation. It's honestly a really good way to keep yourself afloat when dealing with difficult things, but we all know that there are situations where it feels impossible to stay positive. But Carlac, likely due to her time in Avernus, has developed a thought process where she pretty much only focuses on the good aspects of a situation, even going as far as to trying to ignore the negative aspects that she can't do anything about. It's how she's been able to keep fighting her way through life, honestly. She also seems to retain her mind after turning into a mind flare, which is great. It's not a bad ending if you're keen on her not dying and also not making her go back to Avernus. She saved the world and she'll get to live to tell the tale, even if that meant taking the form of a monster and potentially being outcast for the rest of her life. I mean, if Omelium, the, the polite mind flare in the Underdark, can make a nice life for himself, I would like to believe that Carlac could do that as well. She has a future. She has your group that knows who she is. So, it can work out. It honestly feels kind of scummy, though, for me to ask her to make that sacrifice, knowing that I am unwilling to do so myself. But she takes it in strides, and I mean, again, she is the one that offered. But I still feel bad about it. The whole Mind Flare ending, though, is pretty well contrasted against her breakdown in the epilogue scenes if you don't transform her. After the fight is over and everyone is starting to go their separate ways, Carlac's engine fails her. It's lasted just long enough to take down the Absolute. She put up a fight and now she's spent. Carlac is literally in the process of shutting down right there on the docks of Baldur's Gate. <sighs> Engine's finally cooked. Held on just long enough. So, how'd I do? So are you. My friend. My companion. I adore you. <sighs> I thought 
one thing I can't be, isn't it? I wanted to live in my city with my friends. But life is for the living. And I saw... She breaks. She's she's not ready to die. Not yet. She's happy that, that you won. She's grateful for the time she got to spend with you. She did her best, but it's not enough. She can't live in Baldur's Gate with her new friends. She's got to say goodbye to it all after she had just gotten it back. She tries to maintain her optimism, though focusing on the short life that she did get to live with you and with your companions. Even if you don't romance her, she'll talk about how she adored you. You, who trusted her, fought by her side and worked hard to help her and everyone else. You, who would never turn on her or rat her out or sell her out to the, the next best thing. It's bittersweet, honestly. She's sad to go, sad to burn up and have to miss out on all the life she could have lived afterwards. You can either stand back and stay with her in her final moments as the fires rage, burning her from the inside out, reducing her to ash. But you can also talk her into going to Avernus to save herself. In my playthrough, I got the opportunity to volunteer to go with her, but I didn't because I wanted to see what my ending with Astarian was going to be like. I uh, still haven't seen it though because it's glitched out and we're just standing in a room, not talking, social distancing. I'm, wa I'm waiting for my husband to return from the war. Anyway, I had Will on my team though, so it's fine. At this, By the end of the game, depending on how things play out with Will, um, he might have decided that he's just gonna go to Avernus and fight devils once all this is over. Become the Blade of Avernus instead of the Blade of Frontiers. So, I was able to talk Karlak into going to Avernus with him. Well, more like, Will brings it up because, after all, they're friends and he doesn't want to see her die. No, stop. I won't allow this. Karlak, you're coming with me. Back to Avernus. We can't let her die. Not like this. Not now. She wouldn't be alone in a furnace. She wouldn't be forced back into servitude for Zariel. She would have Will. Or you and Will. Or you. Like, she would have somebody by her side if you talk her into going. She wouldn't be a slave again. She wouldn't be alone. These are the two things that she thought to be worse than death. She'd have more of a fighting chance with a loyal ally or two on her side. So she concedes. It won't be as bad with someone by her side. She doesn't have to fight that option very much at all, actually. So I think a part of her is grateful that she's now got people in her corner willing to fight for her. She's giving in to the hope. They have to leave right that moment, though, since she's literally dying as we speak. But they go. Saving Karlak's life and allowing her the chance to get her heart back. Or at least providing hope that she can get revenge on Zariel. It's a little unclear. Baldur's Gate 3 has a lot to say about revenge, and it's not all negative. It recognizes that sometimes revenge provides needed closure. Revenge is taking the splinter out of a wound so it can heal. It can be a necessary component. But the game also recognizes that it's not going to be this big moment where everything is suddenly fine, and it's not going to fill you with joy. I love that about this game. And I love that the story still gives the characters the space they need to explore resolutions for their trauma. For Karlak, that can look like returning to Avernus with friends by her side, ready to take back what's rightfully hers. Except, the game doesn't delve into what happens in Avernus, it's kind of left up to our imaginations. Unlike Astarian, Karlak doesn't have a narratively correct choice for her story. With Astarian, given the themes of his character arc, it's very easy to see the Ascended ending being the bad one. It's the ending that traps him in the cycles of power and tyranny. He becomes the abuser. But with Karlak, every ending kind of feels like a bad one. Or not a great one. 
Sure, if you let her die on the docks, burnt up by her infernal engine, she is going out on her own terms, not forced to return to the place where she was tormented for a decade. And in some ways, you can see that as a good ending. There's power in reclaiming your life and going out on your own terms. But she still has so much to give, so much life to live, and I believe that there is still hope for her. If given the chance, our band of unlikely friends could probably figure out a way to restore her heart, or at the very least, work out some compromise, making Avernus more of a home for her and she can come visit Faerun when she can for short periods of time. I mean, our group literally fought gods, well, avatars of gods, defeated a devil in his own home, depending on how you played, and we've made the impossible possible. So why can't we just go take down Zariel for Karlak? I think we could do it. Maybe give us like a few more levels and we can make it happen. So because I have that in mind, I do push for her to keep fighting for her life. We can figure this out. We will figure this out. So go back to Avernus with Will by your side and I'll see what I can do about getting the gang back together to go raise hell in the hells. The other option is turning her into a mind flayer, which I guess would be the best ending if you take into consideration her own wishes. She's the one who offers to turn, since she's dying already, she's not sacrificing a future because she thinks she doesn't have one. So might as well be the motherfucker who saved the world, her words not mine. And if you're taking her agency and her desires into consideration, then yes, this would be her best ending. This is the ending where she has the most agency, she does make the most choices for herself, and she gets to do things on her own terms, but not die up immediately. As long as you don't do the evil fucked up thing at the end and take over the world, killing her in the process, which if you're playing a character who would do that, you probably aren't super close to Karlak in that run, since she's very good natured and wouldn't approve of a lot of the more morally reprehensible options. So there's that. So depending on how you read her story or how you interpret the epilogue and what you're capable of doing post game, the mind flare may be the best option. I just have audacity and think that I can kill gods in Dungeons and Dragons, so I'm gonna go for the Avernus ending. There's no, there's no right or wrong ending here. All of them are fine. All of them equally recognize her hum humanity in a way. Some more so than others. Well, wait, let me rephrase that. This part, I'm, I'm off script right now. Every, all three of the possible endings for Karlak recognize that she's a human being, and it does take into consideration that she can make decisions for herself. You can let her burn up on her own, take life into her own hands. You could talk her into going to Avernus, but you can't, well, maybe you can force her. I didn't force her. I talked her into it which is different. <laughs> and while it does kind of throw her agency and her desires out the window, there's still the thought that we can fix things and make the inevitable inevitable, which is something she did express a desire to do earlier on before she came to terms with the fact that she's dying and there's nothing she can do about it. I think there's something we can do about it. So with that in mind, going to Avernus is also taking her, her humanity and her life into consideration. And then the mind flare thing, she chose to do it. It was a really good compromise between living and not returning to the literal hells. So I do love that there's no wrong ending for Karlak. And you could say there's no wrong ending for anybody. It all depends on the story you're trying to tell with your game. Um, but for some characters, there is an ending that thematically works better like Astarian and the Ascension versus non-ascending or honestly the Shadow Heart and the Dark Justice Year versus not being a Dark Justice Year. Either way, the endings are the endings for Karlak all thematically serve a very similar purpose. That purpose being she gets to reclaim her life, more or less. Karlak is a character who is mostly overwhelmingly positive, but she's not boxed into that stereotype. She's allowed to have feelings and to express herself in ways that's not just positive vibes only. She's allowed to express her hurt and pain and to be upset. 
Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't box any of their characters into an archetype left to stagnate in shallow characterization. They're all living, breathing, human, and fleshed out. I love that Karlak is allowed to be a fully realized creation, not just a character or a caricature of a barbarian, rage-filled and nothing else, or the poster child for good vibes thinking. Both are aspects of her, but not her entirety. Karlak's story is also very similar to Astarian's. Stripped away of her humanity and autonomy, forced to do someone else's bidding, tortured and tormented for a good chunk of their lives. But her response couldn't be more different. She doesn't abandon her hope, she clings on to what people can't take from her. Her will to fight and survive. Her will to be happy. While Astarian lets his lived experiences paint how he sees the world, Karlak still holds out hope that the world is a place full of love and kindness. She holds out hope that there's beauty in life. It would be so easy for her to be just as jaded and worn down as Astarian, but she pushes herself to be different. I don't think she thinks of herself in this way, but Karlak is out here bringing the light into the world that she believes is there. Damon pretty much says as much when he says the world would be better with her in it, even if she were in Avernus. And I think he's right. Karlak is very good-hearted, good-natured, and holds on very strongly to her philosophies. Not to say that Astarian is weak for his response to trauma, nor to say that Karlak is better for it. They're both explorations of different ways that people can respond. They're not the same person, and this game would be kind of boring if all the characters were that similar in how they responded to things. They're parallels of one another, two sides of the same coin. They're the same, but different. They contrast with one another pretty well, and I think part of what makes that contrast work is how steadfast Karlak is in her beliefs, how determined she is to see the good in others, aside from those who are downright bad, like Gortash or the fake paladins. She's willing to give people like Will the benefit of the doubt. If Karlak was to be swayed into giving in to the cycles of power and tyranny, she'd be no different from Astarian. Astarian is a character that very much is what you make him out to be. If you see Astarian as an evil bastard, he's going to be an evil bastard. But if you see that there's more to him than that facade, then he'll be more than that. Karlak, though, she is who she is despite what you make of her. So if Karlak were to be swayed into giving into the cycles of power and tyranny like Astarian, she wouldn't be herself. She doesn't see a reason in giving in. There's no temptation for her. She feels strong enough on her own. The greed for power doesn't cling to her. She's just happy to be able to exist. Something that is partially true for everyone. Happy to exist, but sometimes the promise of something more is enticing. The promise of being able to protect your loved ones when you feel inadequate to do so as you are. It makes sense why some of the characters have lapses in their judgment. It is very human of them. But it's also human to cling so hard to your beliefs as Karlak does. I love Karlak. One of these days, I will romance her, trust. As soon as I find my way out, as soon as I'm able to claw my way from Astarian's chokehold, I love how infectious Karlak's excitement to be alive is. I love how she's a great reminder that sometimes I should really focus on the silver linings, the positive aspects of a situation. But sometimes it is okay to dwell on painful negatives. It's okay to feel and to express these things, and sometimes you need to. I love how good-natured she is, and how she encourages us to be good as well. Which is a fun balance if you are doing a more morally gray run, or are one of the people who think you have to be an evil bastard to get a Saurian to like you. I love how Karlak's story, while doomed by the narrative, isn't all doom and gloom. She's allowed to truly live, even if it's for a short while. She's allowed to love and to get upset and to just exist. Doomed by the narrative, sure, but less doomed if she can walk that path alongside people who love her. Human connections and growing close to others is a huge component in every companion's personal story. It's through building these connections that the player gets to learn about these characters and help them see what choices need to be made 
and to build relationships either platonic or romantic. And Carlac's story really takes advantage of these relationships depending on the ending you push for. It's through her connections with you and or Will that gives her the strength to keep fighting, fighting her death and returning to Avernus. Because with that companionship, she's able to find the power to overcome the impossible. While her story ties into the overall themes of overcoming cycles of abuse, her personal theme is strength in your connections. The power of friendship, if you will. But it's not done in a cheesy way. It's no stereotypical shonen anime here. Although Carlac would love shonen action anime. Somebody show that woman Naruto. <laughs> I really just ended this with Carlac is all about the power of friendship. But like it's it's kind of true and it is very not fair to just assume that her story would be like a Starian's. In a way it is, but in a way it's not. But also you could argue that the power of friendship is kind of like a big theme for everyone's everyone's stuff because it is that friendship with these characters that allow you to have a sway in their narrative. But for Carlac, it feels more blatant. And it definitely lines up more with her personality than some other characters. <laughs> anyway, thank you for watching this video. I was a bit nervous I wouldn't have as much to say about her as I did Astarian. So I hope I did her justice. I don't think this video is going to be as long as the Astarian one, but the script is only a, like a couple pages shorter. So I was very surprised by that. I am going to cover the other companions as well, so don't you worry, Baldur's Gate enjoyers. It is not all Black Butler over here. <laughs> I'm thinking of doing Gale next, just as a little sneak peek as what I'm working on. I mentioned earlier I'm doing a Bloodweave playthrough right now to get clips, so when you see a Starion and all my Gale clips, mind your business. <laughs> I just feel like Gale's story, like Astarian's, is better told through a romance playthrough, so that's what I'm doing. I feel like I hardly got to know him on my other playthroughs. Whereas Carlac's story doesn't feel as locked into her romance. It's not changed or really enhanced by romancing her. At least not from what I could tell. I've discussed this with some people who have romanced her and they kind of agree with me. So, that's my sources. Uh, please let me know, though, if you feel like the romance did greatly change her story for you. I would love to hear about it. Anyway, until next time. Bye!